Be sure to follow this ministry on BitChute and Rumble because this channel could disappear any day. Don't forget to subscribe. Also, if you haven't already, subscribe to my YouTube backup channel. Links are in the description box and in my pinned comment below. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963. Thank you all so much for your prayers and support. God bless. Welcome to the Watchman channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And if you dance with a girl, I think it's so cool. Jojo Siwa will make history on the upcoming season of ABC's Dancing with the Stars. For the first time in its 30 seasons in the U.S., same-sex partners will compete in the competition. Jojo will be paired with another woman. It's going to be the best ever. I can't wait to just dance every single week. I can't wait to meet my partner. Oh my gosh, there's so many things I'm so excited for. Jojo recently opened up about her sexuality, saying she was a member of the LGBTQ plus community and in a relationship. Jojo got her big break dancing on the show Dance Moms. Please welcome Jojo to the stage. And now she'll be the one wowing audiences every week with her partner-to-be. Glad said in a statement in part, at 18, Jojo Siwa is once again using her platform to inspire and uplift the LGBTQ community. The show has such a wide, far-reaching audience, and there is a real opportunity here for people to celebrate the same-sex pairing and root for Jojo and all LGBTQ young people. We now live in an Isaiah 520 world where evil is good and good is evil, where the sin of being a homosexual or transgender is openly celebrated and even glorified. One of the many signs that we are living in the end times is the epidemic of homosexuality that is sweeping the world today. Jesus said he would return at a time when society parallels the days of Lot, as we read in Luke 17, 28 through 30. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. To find out what parallels our days with the days of Lot, we need to go back to the book of Genesis. Genesis 19, 1-5 now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground, and said, My lords, please turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise up early and go on your way. They said, No, we will spend the night in the town square. But he pressed them strongly, so they turned aside to him and entered his house, and he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. But before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man, surrounded the house. And they called to Lot, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us, that we may know them. The term know them isn't a friendly handshake and how are you. It is to know them in a sexual way. What parallels our days with the days of Lot is homosexuality. Just as in the days of Lot, not only is homosexuality widely accepted today, but it's being taught to our kids just like in Sodom, as we read in verse 4. The men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man, surrounded the house. An online video posted by an Orange County teacher suggesting her students say the Pledge of Allegiance to the Pride flag has now gone viral. NBC4's Vicki Vargas has more about the teacher's status at school today. The sign outside Back Bay Monta Vista High looks like a Memorial Day display. It is surrounded by dozens of small American flags. There are just over 160 students at this alternative education high school. But all of this red, white, and blue is in response to a TikTok video posted Friday by teacher Kristen Pitson about how she handles the Pledge of Allegiance in her classroom. So my class decided to stand but not say the words. Totally fine. She then goes on to explain there is no American flag hanging where she teaches. It used to be there, but I took it down during COVID because it made me uncomfortable. Early this morning, a small rally in front of the school as people gathered to show support for the American flag. 
In the meantime, I tell this kid, we do have a flag in the class that you can pledge your allegiance to. And he like looks around and he goes, oh, that one? Just super disgusted. Um, I just couldn't believe how uh, ignorant she seemed to be. Outraged, parents have been asking the Newport Mesa Unified School District to discipline Pitson. This is part of their response. Quote, showing respect for our nation's flag is a value that we instill in our students and an expectation of our employees. The teacher is no longer in the classroom. There is an ongoing investigation. Also outside the school, a handful of rainbow flags and a sign saying, Liberty for All. Yes, I think she should have been removed from the classroom. Um, quite frankly, I think she should be fired and removed from the school district. There are many people within the church who are teaching that homosexuality is not a sin, when scripture clearly says it is. This is another sign Jesus gave to look for prior to his second coming, as we read in Matthew 24:11. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Homosexuality is strongly condemned in the Bible. Ezekiel 16, 49-50 Look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride, fullness of food, and an abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. And they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore I took them away as I saw fit. What was this prideful abomination committed before God? The answer is found in the book of Leviticus. Leviticus 18.22 You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. Leviticus 20.13 If a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. God gives mankind a dire warning for the acts of homosexuality in 2 Peter 2.6 And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. God also offers forgiveness to those who are living a life of homosexuality as we read in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. Does Satan have the power to control the weather? The increasing number of natural disasters and terrible storms have many people wondering who controls the weather, God or Satan. Some point to the descriptions of Satan as the prince of the power of the air in Ephesians 2.2 and the God of this world in 2 Corinthians 4.4 as evidence for Satan having control over the weather. An examination of scripture reveals that whatever influence Satan has over the weather is restricted by God's ultimate sovereignty. The devil, our adversary, must be taken seriously. We should acknowledge his existence and his limited power over the secular world. At the same time, Satan, a defeated fallen angel, is very powerful but not divine, having only the power that God ultimately allows. The Bible specifies 42 months or three and a half years that the Antichrist will have worldwide influence as we read in Revelation 13, five through eight. And he, the Antichrist, was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. It was granted to him, the Antichrist, to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Notice it was given to him and granted to him to do these things. God is sovereign 
and the Antichrist, who at this time is indwelt by Satan, has no power except what is given or granted by God. If Satan could impact the weather, it would only be by God's permission and restrained, as in the case of Job. Satan was allowed by God to torment Job in order to test him, and this included the fire of God, probably lightning, which fell from the sky and burned up the sheep and the servants, as we read in Job 1.16. While he was still speaking, Another also came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. This was followed by a mighty wind, possibly a tornado, that destroyed his eldest son's home and killed Job's children, as we read in verses 18 and 19. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. So if the fire from heaven and the tornado were somehow caused by Satan, they were still under the ultimate control of God for his purposes. It is God, not Satan, who controls the weather. God controls the skies and the rain. God controls the wind. God has power over the clouds. God has power over lightning. God is in control of all things, including the weather. Through his providence, God provides for and protects his children. But he also permits Satan, demons, and mankind to exercise their limited will to commit acts of sin, evil, and wickedness. We may not always know why evil acts or natural disasters happen, but we can be assured that God is working all things together for his purpose and for our good as we read in Romans 8.28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. These historic and deadly storms to hit the Northeast, the remnants of Hurricane Ida combining with a front, and it spelled disaster. At least seven confirmed tornadoes now, record amounts of rain. New York City's first ever flash flood emergency declared, signaling a severe threat to human life which of course is exactly what then played out. The water rising so quickly, people dying in basement apartments, drivers floating in their cars, and the riders on the subway jumping up onto their seats. Ida has now killed at least 60 people in eight states, more than 40 deaths just from these storms in the Northeast overnight. Tonight, the news just in, those seven confirmed tornadoes now, the ominous sight of this one in Mullica Hill, New Jersey. Catastrophic damage to homes, splintered, ripped apart, destroyed children's belongings seen in yards, and massive and deadly flooding, streets in New York City turning to rivers. These images from Queens, cars underwater, drivers leaving their cars as they were being lifted by the water. Some of those who were killed drowning in their own homes, this home in Queens collapsing in the rain. The rain and flooding bringing the New York City subways and suburban trains all to a halt. Some people trapped on those trains, you can see the waterfalls pouring inside. 10 inches of rain in the Philadelphia area, the Schuylkill River, rising 10 feet in just 12 hours, nearly submerging the Green Lane Bridge. Cars downtown, underwater, up to their windshields. And in the suburb of Bridgeport, Pennsylvania, outside Philadelphia, first responders rescuing people from their flooded homes for hours today. In fact, we learned there were hotel evacuations in the Philadelphia area just a short time ago. We do have it all covered tonight. The leaders across the region acknowledging that these extreme weather events are here to stay. Tonight, the staggering death toll continues to rise across the Northeast after those catastrophic storms. More than three inches of rain in an hour instantly inundating the five boroughs of New York City. Officials declaring the city's first ever flash flood emergency. The image is coming in surreal. Body camera video showing a daring rescue by New York City police of a driver stuck in the middle of Central Park. Yeah, just like, just like that. First responders rescuing hundreds across the city. I see the car start floating, you know. I got to come to the window and jump out. A cascade of water bringing the nation's largest subway system to a screeching halt. Riders standing on the seats of flooded buses in Queens, flooding at Newark Airport, forcing all flights to be canceled. Water rushing through apartment doors and into homes. A Queen's mother and her son were killed when their basement apartment collapsed. Mahen Singh lives next door. I'm still shaking. i never seen something like this before. The water came up within five minutes, like four feet. 
real fast. More than a dozen people killed in New York City alone. A two-year-old boy also among the victims. In Passaic, New Jersey, two people swept away in their car. The mayor reporting live on Facebook. We have too many areas where the flooding has gotten so bad the cars are stuck and we have bodies underwater. We are now we are now retrieving bodies. And four people died at this apartment complex in Elizabeth, New Jersey, across from the fire department, which was also inundated with water. They are reporting that they were inundated with eight feet of water inside the fire headquarters itself. Cars nearby marked with X's to show they were searched. Rescues across the tri-state area continuing long after the sun came up. They are now several hours later being taken out by that front end loader to higher ground. The flash flood water is so powerful and so swift that parked cars in this area were picked up and tossed around like toys. Todd Hoffman of Larchmont, New York owns that SUV and tried desperately to move it to higher ground before the flood swept it away. I knew um, and immediately cracked that door, looked down and said, this, is, this isn't this is smart and get out. So within a matter of seconds, uh, it was, you realized you had to bail. I went 30 feet and it, the, the water rose within those 30 feet. Um, it was terrifying. By noon, the major Deegan Expressway still flooded and littered with cars. Officials warning today that while this has been called a one in a 500 year event, extremes like this are likely to become all the more common. Records are broken, but what is fascinating is that the records that they broke were literally set a week before. We are in a whole new world now. Let's be blunt about it. We saw a horrifying storm last night unlike anything we have seen before. And Whit Johnson with us tonight from Westchester. And Whit, we know there were warnings from officials and the National Weather Service, even our own weather team right here on the air last night, that this was going to be a very dangerous set of storms. And that rare high risk warning issued for flash flooding, the tornado warning in New York City. But we heard from so many people today saying it was still difficult to imagine the power of all this, the power of the water, until you're right in the middle of it. David, the people we spoke with said they heard the warnings, but it was difficult to prepare for something they've never actually witnessed in their lifetimes. By now, we've all seen those incredible images, the water rushing through the New York City subway system. A record amount of rainfall in such a short period of time caught so many off guard. The signs are all there. The United Nations has declared a climate emergency calling it a code red for humanity. Scientists say the planet is warming faster than at any time in at least 2,000 years. It is unequivocal. This is the beginning right. of a permanent emergency. But what if it's all hogwash? What if what we've really had this year is nothing more than what folks used to call a hot summer, and not even close to the hottest summer this nation has ever experienced? A heat wave in America and hundreds of thousands leave New York. The summer heat this year wasn't even close to 1936. The 1930s were really when the terrible heat waves were. Tony Heller of RealClimateScience.com is an environmentalist who as an electrical engineer helped develop the modern computer microprocessor. His website has become a collection of weather history. History which shows it was a lot hotter 90 and 100 years ago than it is today. The claims that summers are getting hotter are simply not true. During 1936, 21 states set their all-time temperature record, and none set them this year. In the 1930s, most of the nation saw temperatures over 100 degrees. Without air conditioning, it was common for families to sleep outdoors. Many thousands died, and what would become known as the Dust Bowl forced the migration of three and a half million climate refugees out of the Great Plains and Midwest, many of them to California. During the 1930s, places like Wisconsin were seeing temperatures of 114 degrees. North Dakota was 121 degrees. 100 degree temperatures were very common in the Midwest prior to about 1960, but since 1960, they've become much less common. But what about wildfires? News reports suggest they're getting a lot more common. But the record shows wildfire burn acreage is down 90% from the 1920s and 30s. One reason wildfires seem to have increased is because the wildfire data before 1983 has been erased. The website of the National Interagency Fire Center used to show how wildfires were much worse in the 1920s and 30s. That has been removed. 
The reason given by the National Interagency Fire Center? Prior to 1983, the federal wildland fire agencies did not track official wildfire data using current reporting processes. So now when the media visit the website, it shows wildfires steadily getting worse. Heller also shows how NASA has changed its historic weather data. This NASA temperature graph from 1999 showed the warmest temperatures in the 1900s were in the 1920s and 30s. Sometime later, NASA changed the graph, and it now shows U.S. temperatures getting warmer. Joe Bastardi is chief forecaster at weatherbell.com and the author of The Weaponization of Weather in the Phony Climate War. He says catastrophic weather events such as Hurricane Ida are used to show a climate emergency when hurricanes just as strong hit this continent hundreds of years ago. It is astounding what you see going on today as far as the weaponization of each and every weather event. Climate does change. The weather is always changing. The very nature of our creation demands change and reaction. What I do mind is people with a one-sided perspective that won't give people the total picture. But this isn't just a debate about weather. It's costing you money. The Green New Deal proposed by Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez could cost as much as $93 trillion. And most of us are already paying more in taxes because of the belief in a climate emergency that the weather record suggests doesn't exist. The world is baffled at the events taking place in the weather, and yet it was foretold 2,000 years ago in Bible prophecy that this would happen. Satan, the great deceiver, often tries to front-run God by giving people wrong ideas ahead of time about what is prophesied to happen. Satan has tricked mankind into believing that climate change is real and in turn has blinded many people to the gospel of Jesus Christ, as we read in 2 Corinthians 4, 3, and 4. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age is blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God, should shine on them. Climate change is simply Satan's counter to Jesus' signs of his return and the end of the age. Don't let Satan blind you to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The extreme weather the world has been witnessing is not climate change. It is God letting us know our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is returning. Matthew 24, 37-39 But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Jesus tells us in verse 37, when our days parallel the days of Noah, he is returning. One of the things that parallel our days with the days of Noah is the unprecedented flooding the world has been experiencing over the last few years. People across Spain's eastern coast are counting their losses as flooding caused by ongoing heavy rains damaged homes and businesses. Further south in Al Qanar, more than 250 litres per square metre fell in less than six hours. But so far, no lives have been reported lost. The town of Vinaros and northern Castellón are also gradually returning to normal after the passage of Storm Dana. There, 159 litres per square metre were recorded in just one hour. Coastal areas were hardest hit, but the inland region of Castilla-La Mancha was also badly affected. In Toledo province, flash floods swept away cars, damaged roads, flooded businesses and covered the streets of several towns with mud and other debris. In some areas, heavy showers and storms were also accompanied by hail that has ruined crops. This morning, the Northeast is shaken after the remnants of Hurricane Ida swept through, catching many off guard. We lost everything. Torrential downpours, unprecedented flash flooding, and powerful tornadoes battered businesses, homes, and public transit. What we've got to recognize is the suddenness, the brutality of storms now. It is different. In Central Park, record rain, three inches in just one hour. I've been here for more than 20 years and never seen the park like this. 
In the city, at least 13 people are dead, including a two-year-old in Queens, trapped as the floodwaters rose in this basement apartment. It's very, very devastating. In New Jersey, stunning loss. The storm claiming at least 23 lives here. Sadly, tragic, historic 24 hours in New Jersey. There's no other way to put it. A porch camera capturing the moment a home exploded after it was evacuated due to rising water. Luckily, no one heard in the blast. This storm has left destruction in its wake since it first hit the south on Sunday. And now in states across the northeast, a flooding emergency. Video showing a minor league baseball stadium submerged. Cars underwater, livelihoods under threat. Back is filled, basement's filled. From suburban New York to outside Philadelphia, urgent water rescues. And in southern New Jersey, a terrifying EF3 tornado. The National Weather Service now says it packed winds of up to 150 miles an hour. Ashley Thomas is eight months pregnant, her home gone. Everything was just crashing down on us. And this morning, the Connecticut State Police mourned the loss of one of their own. Sergeant Brian Mull died after his cruiser was swept away. We lost another member of our family, and every troop is devastated. Back here in New Jersey, this is what's left of that home that apparently exploded. And now that the waters have receded in this neighborhood, we're seeing cars tossed around here in New York City. City officials say that they had to tow more than 500 vehicles and had to rescue some 800 passengers from the subway system there. Across this region, many residents say they were just caught off guard by the intensity of this storm. This morning, the Northeast is shaken after the remnants of Hurricane Ida swept through, catching many off guard. Across this region, many residents say they were just caught off guard by the intensity of this storm. Jesus goes on to tell us in verses 38 and 39 that when he returns, things will be going on as normal, as people will be eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage. Just as in the days of Noah, when people were caught off guard and the flood came, so also will people of our time be caught off guard when Jesus returns. I believe that time has arrived. Luke 17, 26 through 30. And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives. They were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Just in the days of Noah, when God sent a flood, and in the days of Lot, when God sent fire and brimstone to judge mankind, he is about to send his final judgments on a wicked and unrepentant world. It is evident that planet Earth is in the time Jesus refers to as the birth pains. The world is seeing death, destruction and despair at unprecedented levels. The events the world is suffering through right now, awful as they are, will only get worse. The Bible tells us in the last days, right before Jesus returns, there will be a time of severe distress this world has never seen or ever will see again, as we read in Matthew 24, 21. For then there will be great tribulation, just as it has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. This time of distress Jesus is referring to is called the seven year tribulation in which the inhabitants of planet Earth, who have rejected God and remain unrepentant in their sin, will face his wrath. These terrible judgments are pictured as seven seals opened, seven trumpets blown, and seven bowls poured out. The first four of the seven seals are known as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The book of Revelation tells us when Jesus breaks the first seal and the white horse rides, the Antichrist will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the second seal and the red horse rides, war will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the third seal, and the black horse rides, famine will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the fourth seal and the pale horse rides, death and Hades will be unleashed. The Bible tells us 25% of the population of the earth will be killed at this time, as we read in Revelation 6-8. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was death, and Hades followed with him, and power was given to them over a fourth of the earth, to kill with the sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. The population of the world is roughly 8 billion, meaning 2 billion people will die during this time. When the fifth seal is broken, those who have been slain for the word of God and their testimony will be given white robes and told to rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren 
who would be killed as they were, was completed. When the sixth seal is broken, there will be a great earthquake. The sun will become black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon like blood, and the stars of heaven will fall to the earth. When the seventh seal is broken, there will be silence in heaven for about a half an hour. After seven seals are opened, seven trumpets are blown. When the first angel sounds, vegetation is struck. Hail and fire mingled with blood will be thrown to the earth, and a third of the trees and all the green grass will be burned up. When the second angel sounds, the seas are struck. Something like a great mountain burning with fire is thrown into the sea, which seems to be a meteor causing a third of the sea to become blood, and a third of the living creatures in the sea to die, and a third of the ships to be destroyed. When the third angel sounds, the waters are struck. A great star falls from heaven, burning like a torch on the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood, and a third of the waters become Wormwood and many men will die from the water, because it will be made poisonous. When the fourth angel sounds, the heavens are struck. A third of the sun is struck, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of them are darkened. A third of the day will not shine, and likewise the night. When the fifth angel sounds, Satan is cast down from heaven to release demons from the bottomless pit, to torment those who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads for five months. When the sixth angel sounds, a demonic army numbering 200 million will kill a third of mankind. Four billion people have now died at this time, equaling half of the world's population. When the seventh angel sounds, the temple of God is opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant is seen in his temple, and there are lightnings, noises, thunderings, an earthquake, and great hail. After seven trumpets have sounded, seven bowls are poured out. When the first angel pours out his bowl, a foul and loathsome sore will come upon the men who have the mark of the beast and those who worship his image. When the second angel pours out his bowl on the sea, it will become blood as of a dead man, and every living creature in the sea will die. When the third angel pours out his bowl, the rivers and springs of water will become blood. When the fourth angel pours out his bowl on the sun, power is given to him to scorch men with fire, and men are scorched with great heat. When the fifth angel pours out his bowl on the throne of the beast, his kingdom becomes full of darkness, and they will gnaw their tongues because of the pain. When the sixth angel pours out his bowl, it results in the Euphrates River being dried up and the armies of the Antichrist being gathered together to wage the battle of Armageddon. When the seventh angel pours out his bowl, a loud voice comes out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. A devastating earthquake flattening everything on planet earth followed by giant hailstones weighing 100 pounds each completes the seal, trumpet, and bowl judgments. God's judgment against this wicked and unrepentant world will leave no doubt as to his wrath against sin. Revelation 20, 11 through 15. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead, who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Is your name written in the book of life? If not, I pray you get that done today, as we are not guaranteed tomorrow. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear, that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world, as we know it, is near. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. When a person comes to know Jesus as their Savior, they are brought into a relationship with God that guarantees their salvation as eternally secure. To be clear, Salvation is more than saying a prayer or making a decision for Christ. Salvation is a sovereign act of God, whereby an unregenerate sinner is washed, renewed, 
and born again by the Holy Spirit, as we read in John 3.3 and Titus 3.5. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. When salvation occurs, God gives the forgiven sinner a new heart and puts a new spirit within him, as we read in Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. The spirit will cause the saved person to walk in obedience to God's word, as we read in Ezekiel 36, 27 and James 2, 26. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So what about repentance? Repentance is not a work we do to earn salvation. No one can repent and come to God unless God draws that person to himself, as we read in John 6:44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Repentance is something God gives. It is only possible because of his grace. All of salvation, including repentance and faith, is a result of God drawing us, opening our eyes, and changing our hearts. God's long-suffering leads us to repentance, and so does his kindness, as we read in 2 Peter 3.9 and Romans 2.4. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Ephesians 2, 8, 9 declares, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Works are not the cause of salvation. Works are the evidence of salvation. Faith in Christ always results in good works. The person who claims to be a Christian but lives in willful disobedience to Christ has a false or dead faith and is not saved. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. That is why John the Baptist called people to produce fruit in keeping with repentance, as we read in Matthew 3.8. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. A person who has truly repented of his sin and exercised faith in Christ will give evidence of a changed life as we read in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. A person who has not repented of their sin and exercised faith in Christ will give evidence of the works of the flesh, as we read in Galatians 5.19-21. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. A person who has crucified the flesh and belongs to Christ will give evidence of the Spirit, as we read in Galatians, 522 through 24. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Believers are born again, regenerated when they believe. For a Christian to lose his salvation, he would have to be unregenerated. The Bible gives no evidence that the new birth can be taken away. The Holy Spirit indwells all believers, as we read in John 14, 17. The Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. The Holy Spirit baptizes all believers into the body of Christ, as we read in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For a believer to become unsaved, he would have to be unindwelt and detached from the body of Christ. John 3.15 states, 
that whoever believes in Jesus Christ will have eternal life. If you believe in Christ today and have eternal life, but lose it tomorrow, then it was never eternal at all. Hence, if you lose your salvation, the promises of eternal life in the Bible would be in error. Scripture says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Remember, the same God who saved you is the same God who will keep you. Once we are saved, we are always saved. Praise God, our salvation is most definitely, eternally secure. Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church, you may be at work, you may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready.